It's seven o'clock. The day's work is ended. And you're in the attic of a bald man which is filled with wine. It can only mean one thing. It's the wine show at home. Welcome. Welcome. And here's, here's Dino. Dino Vino Daxandy is on there. Instagram, you can give him a visit. Aren't you happy? Poor old Dino's not very well, actually. He's had to go to the vet. He's got a bit of a lurgy, sort of on his tummy. Daxons get that. It's nothing to do with the drinking, though. Now then, are you going to stay with us, or are you going to be difficult? You can go and sort of drop down. If you hear yipping, <laughs> that's the Daxon. Right. Say goodbye to everybody, Dee. You can say goodbye. It'd be lovely to see you all. There we go. Oh, little Daxons. Right, he may pop back a little bit later on. Welcome, welcome along. Welcome along. I am wine smeller persuivant, Joe Fatterini, your guide for the next you know, 20 minutes, something like that. And we are going to showcase well, various things. We've got three fabulous wines from one of Britain's great independent local wine merchants. Uh, we've got, we say thank you very much to one of our public services. Um, we're going to answer your questions. Keep sending in the questions. You can write them in just here and I'll go and answer them. We've got some great ones today. And um, we're going to go and highlight a couple of initiatives round and about. So let's get started. Let's get started. Who are we with today? We're with Phil Glass and Swigget. Now, I don't know if there actually was a Mr. Phil Glass and a Mr. Swigget. I think possibly it's a joke. Uh, Phil Glass and Swigget deliver nationwide. There are free deliveries if you order enough. Um, but they also have stores in Marlebone in London. Really lovely store there. And just near Marble Arch. And there's one in Battersea. I'm curiously well informed on Battersea because I used to work around the corner from Battersea. Battersea was the place where people first grew asparagus in Britain. You weren't expecting that. And if you eat asparagus, it makes your wee wee smell of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Bit of a wine tasting joke there. Um, it was also the home of the first football match played under FA rules, which I know because, uh, bang on about this all the time, uh, my great-grandfather, that is his ring, is the man who made the FA Cup in 1911. That was won by Bradford City, the one and only time. By curious coincidence, Bradford City's chairman at the time was a Mr Fatterini. I'm saying nothing, but uh, yes, it stayed at home for the first game between two cousins. And um, Battersea also features, and there's a weird sort of wine connection, I quite like these wine connections, it features in a, uh, there's an album cover, isn't there, with, by the Pink Floyd, got an album cover, and Pink Floyd went and recorded The Wall, which is uh, their next album, at Studio Miraval in Provence, and that is where Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie now, now make Miraval wine. It was also where I think Wham recorded there and UB40 and Shirley Bassey. That's it. Right, enough. I'm, I'm not going to start doing Welsh accents. Uh, right, what are we doing today? Today we, we bring these along with some friends and so on. So one of the friends who's helped us get this up on air, thank you very much indeed, one of our great uh, friendship partners, is Winerist. I know we can't go away on holiday, but do look into. Go and visit our website and look up our partners and go to visit Winerist. And dream of where you might end up. We'll go and give you some advice and sort of possible thoughts as we go through the course of today. Um, and you will see Deanna Isaac of Winerist. She appears in series three of The Wine Show. Does very well, actually. It's a great little piece. So we'll think about where we're going to go on holiday, when we're allowed out, not going just yet. Um, and we also, we always like to say hello and thank you and whatnot to a few people. So who are we bringing this along to today? I didn't get a photo of my postman, but I do want to say thank you to the Royal Mail, who've been getting letters. I got a letter really quickly today. They're um, amazing postal service, given everything that's going on. So thank you very much for the Royal Mail, uh, for still always delivering all the time. And the other thing I just want to highlight, are you a hotelier, restaurateur or bar owner? Um, and have you sort of had to shut that you'd like to be able to carry on in business? Right, have a look at this. This is local. It's for food and drink deliveries. And let me have a quick read here. It says, uh, you want to be able to offer home deliveries or a click and collect service to all the customers in your local area. We're all about local here. Um, you can offer home deliveries using this easy to use local app. So what you do is visit uh, the website mylocaldelivers.com or down the local app from Google Play or the App Store and it will get you up and running. It doesn't cost anything to go and download the app. 
uh, it will go and get you up and running so you can start going and doing deliveries for people and get your business ticking over, which is what we'd all like to go and see. Thanks very much. You know, either home deliveries or click and collect will trottle out and stand two metres away from you and pick it up. So let's get stuck into some wine. And then I'll, ask, I'll answer a few questions. I'd like to go and have a glass of wine first. What have we got first here? Benito Ferrara, Greco di Tufo, Vigna Cigogna, 2018. There are smart wines today. Thank you, Phil Glass and Swigert. Not just from me, but from the NHS staff who are going to get these suitably disinfected bottles when I'm done. I think uh, my GP's friends will be squabbling over these. Um, this is run by a fourth generation family and they are down in Campania, so very near to Mount Vesuvius and Pompeii, which is sort of relevant because intense uh, stone fruit, but it's got a minerally tang about it. Mm. I don't know if I'm just saying this, but it's a kind of smoky whiff, which is delicious. It's a layered, very textured mouthfeel on the on this so it's quite a, a substantial wine what is interesting about this Greco di Tufo the Greek grape variety we think grown on Tufo which is sort of boiled limestone like fluffy pumice sort of stone and we know that it was one of the grape varieties we believe it was one of the grape varieties in a wine called Falernian and I think it was Galen he was a Roman historian he um reckoned that there was much more Falernian that was sold in the Roman Empire than was actually ever made in Campania. Not for the first time. I've heard it once said that there is more Pe Petrus 82 in Las Vegas than Petrus made in 1982. So the Romans got there first. Tell you what, watch uh, season one of The Wine Show. There's a brilliant episode about Rudy Coney Allen. You can also watch a film about him. Oh, it's Sour Grapes, but Maureen Downey. Hello, Maureen, if you're watching. Love to see you again very soon when this is all over. Um, Maureen kind of hunted down Rudy, Rudy Canyon and his company has a great sort of business now looking at uh, fraudulent wines, stopping people from selling fraudulent wine. And it's a big problem around the world of wine. Um, and it was a big problem back in ancient Rome. Um, Falernian was the first wine-ish to be exported to the United Kingdom as well. There you go, this is a bit of a sort of history. So we have been importing this great variety, certainly into the UK, for about 2,000 years, maybe a little bit more. It's a very long time. If you, if you get to go down there, go to Pompeii, there's a lovely bit of graffiti, and in Latin it says, one ass for wine, and ass, A-S, not ass, A-S was like a coin. Uh, two asses for the best wine, and four for Falernian, that was sort of twice as expensive as even the best wine that you could go and buy at the time. A bit of history. That's one for Dan. Thank you very much, Dan, who got in touch. He said, I really like it when you do history on this. Well, Dan, there you go. There's a little bit of history. But you know, Falernian was quite something. There was, um, the best one was called Faustian Falernian, and it was a guy called Faustus, and he, um, he owned the best sort of vineyard sites that they grew on. We should go and answer, answer a few questions whilst we get stuck into this. Uh, let me go and have a look. What do we have here? Um, right. Zoltan Nagy, how is my book Wine Queens not in your wine li library, your library wine section? Dear. <laughs> oh, dear. Everyone else? Um, I don't know. I've, I would love to. Uh, get in touch and tell me how I can get hold a copy of Wine Queens. It sounds like a good book. It could be various things with the title like that. So I'm quite looking forward to seeing, uh, seeing what that book has. Um, what else do we have? Uh, Britt Davis says, uh, wonderful note, thanks from Kilgore, Texas. I never knew there was a place called Kilgore, Texas, but I do know who Colonel Bill Kilgore was. Remember, was it Dennis Hopper played him? It was um, the Colonel in Apocalypse Now. The one who says, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. I much prefer the smell of Greco de Tufo in the morning. But yeah, Colonel Bill, Kil Bill Kilgore, he goes surfing in uh, our pockets now. Weird wine facts. Um, the Playboy scene um, in Apocalypse Now was filmed at Black Stallion Ranch, which is a winery now in, in California, in the Napa Valley. And it was because they had such terrible luck, they had to sort of do it there. They couldn't carry on in the Philippines. So they actually filmed it in California. Uh, this is a bit where they play Susie Q. Uh, anyway, sorry, Britt Brit Davis, have you ever tried any Texas wines? Uh, I would like to suggest a couple, Becker and Lost Oak. 
I think I possibly have Lost Oak because I think they're from Burleston, Texas, if I remember rightly. Um, and I think he makes a really good Merlot, just off the top of my head. And one thing I do know, I'm pretty certain I've had Burlston, um, Lost Oak Merlot from Burleston. Um, I do know that the Texas wine industry is 100 years older than the California wine industry. It's actually much, much older, so more heritage to it. Weird wine fact. Um, next question, Gabrielle Faust. We've just been talking about Faustus in uh, Filoni. Um, looking forward to watching this on a regular basis. Hello from Texas, well, hello back. Get in touch, everybody, just sort of give us a shout. Um, we'll be absolutely delighted. Quite a lot of Americans, so, um, McKenna Cut, or is it Cut McKenna? Anyway, uh, awesome show as usual. Thanks very much. We've only done three. <laughs> we, we're learning from our mistakes so that we can fully <laughs> repeat them in every subsequent episode. That's the idea. Um, just an hour from the Finger Lakes area. Um, what do you like? I'll tell you what I quite like from the Finger Lakes area. Um, Forge Cellars. Now that is a collaboration between a, a winemaker in the Finger Lakes area and a guy called Louis Barrowell, who makes uh, Chateau Saint-Com down in the Rhone Valley. We had lots of Rhone wines actually already. And I remember having a lunch with him and somebody once asked him innocently what he thought of um, de-stemming in the Northern Rhone. And he disrupted the entire restaurant by shouting, no, 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 stamping his fist on the table. And he said, do they stem in the Northern Rhone is a nonsense. So I would never go and de-stem in the Northern Rhone. Good, right, let's have our next wine. Let's have our next wine. Here we go. This is, let's have a look, let's get my notes. Lost and Found, Russian River Pinot Noir, 2014. Thank you very much, Phil Glass and Swigert. This is £44.95. This is super smart wine. It is super smart wine. Perfumed and layered. There's raspberry and cherry. Sweet aromas, bone dry palate. Now, it's made by Jeff Kruth. Jeff Kruth, um, Master Sommelier. He's certainly one of the people behind it. Um, I know Jeff's background, he's the chief executive of the Master, the Quarter Master Sommeliers, I think he has been anyway, uh, chief, chief executive officer, chief operating officer, I think he works with Ronan Saban in London, I can't get it right, quite right. I'm writing a book about sommeliers at the moment, so Jeff, thank you very much, cheers if you're watching. There are fewer Master Sommeliers in the world than there are Masters of Wine, and you are more likely to f meet somebody who's been in space than somebody who's passed uh, either of those exams. In fact, possibly both of those exams put together. I think there's still probably not as many people as been in space. Incredibly hard to go and pass. Sommeliers make wine slightly differently to, if you like, regular winemakers. They're sort of more exacting. I don't know. There's more precision. There's a sort of... Um, there's often a slightly... Well, I don't know. They're great to go with food. They're made as real foodie wines, as you might imagine, with sommeliers. That is delicious. It's got some time to go, actually. That will evolve beautifully over the years. Now, we did have a question. I can't remember who asked this, but somebody sent in a question. I'm really sorry if I can't remember your name, but you were asking, how can you have a blend of different clones if it's all from one grape variety? This is a blend of different clones all from one grape variety. Some uh, grape varieties, like, for instance, I mean, Chardonnay, mostly you just have one clone of it. I, mean, I know that the Mendoza clone of Chardonnay is often what gets used. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc often I think is just one clone that you'll go and have. Pinot Noir, you have lots of different clones so it's, I don't know, it's a bit like how you can have beagles with different leg lengths, dachshunds. So you get wire-haired ones and smooth-coated ones and uh, long-coated ones. Some are standard dachshunds and some are miniatures and some are like teacups. So the sort of different expressions are fundamentally the same thing. And in a Pinot Noir, if you just had one clone, it would be like, you know, having a very big wire-haired dachshund, but it'd have none of the qualities of a very little one. So you blend them all together to get a more balanced wine. So in this case, I know this has got Pomard 777 in it, which is quite a big, bold clone of Pinot Noir, but it's not got lots of pure perfume and fragrance. So I don't know, there's a bit of 153. I think there's three clones in this. So the idea is you blend together these different variations on effectively the same sort of Dachshund clone theme. Does that make sense? 
we're sort of getting some sense out of that. Hopefully that kind of answers your question. Another wine before I completely lose it. Um, Pira Barolo Vigna Rionda 2015. This is really quite smart, actually. <laughs> I'm really, really chuffed. Now, this is probably smart wine. The, the G, my GP, who is taking these wines, because they're unopened, I've used a Coravin just to take out a glass, and so we wipe them down with a disinfecting wipe, and then I give them to my GP. She passes them on to colleagues in the health service. Um, they're going to be fighting over this. This is £80. Well, £79.95. £70, but I've got to tell you, if I was opening Burgundy that was this good, it would be £179.95. This is glorious stuff. Mm. Perfumed, aromatic, typically people say tar and roses. It is a bit tarry, it's sort of rubbery petrochemically. Don't take that the wrong way, it's delicious. Fragrant, wild fruits, wild raspberries, wild strawberries. Bone dry on the palate. It is beautifully dry though. Fine, very fine grain tannins, a sort of like really good leather. Oh. That and very, very good steaks. Be divine. It comes from these tiny little parcels of Nebbiolo. There's a great variety in this is Nebbiolo. It often looks a bit like Pinot Noir. Let's see if we can go and hold these two up. So n neither of them are really inky dark, but Nebbiolo is often browner. You might be able to catch that. It's a slightly sort of browner tinge. If I had Cliff the cameraman, hello Cliff, or Jamie, I know that we would be doing lots of swirly, swirly, sniffy, sniffy, and then you'll get to see the colours. The Pinot Noir has a more bright ruby colour. This is a bit more russety. Uh, Nebbiolo, it, it comes from the Italian word nebbia, meaning fog. Now, weirdly, I always thought it was because the vineyards lay in that sort of foggy rim of the Po Valley. It's not to do with that. It's because when they, they get a bloom on the outside and it makes them look like they're fogged up on the outside. So they're a, literally a foggy grape. Um, we also know that um, the Romans, I think, was it, they called it, is it Spanna, which is one of the, or Cavanesca, that's it. Spanner and Cavanesca are also names, but one of them comes because it looks like blueberry bushes. It might be Cavanesca, maybe. I can't remember exactly. Anyway, that is the sort of origins. Now, there's a weird story, and I tweeted about this a couple of days ago, so forgive me if some of you have come across this. I was on a walk once with a guy called Barry Blumberg. It's a totally true story. It's relevant to our current situation. And I was, as I'm walking along, we were talking about Nebbiolo. And I'd kind of forgotten the time that it was Nebbiolo we were talking about. Because Nebbiolo, a bit like our clone question before, there are various sorts of Nebbiolo. At one point, I think they were believed to be four. There are probably sort of two. Um, but you've got Lampia and... I can't remember the name of the other one. And it'll come back to me in a minute. But there are these sort of two versions of it. And the, what they discovered, I'm telling this guy, Barry, he's a New Yorker, came from Brooklyn, lovely man who's in his 80s, trundling, trundling along. It was a bit of a walking holiday. We're going to Yorkshire Dale, so we're going, for those of you who know, Grassington, Kettlewell, Buckton. We were stopping at Kettlewell for lunch. So I'm chatting to this old New Yorker, and we're talking about politics and why, and, and he asked what I'd do, and I was, I'd been studying about viruses. And so I'm saying, well, one of the things about these variations of Nebbiolo clones is that of the two, Lampia and it might be Miche or something like that. They, they were very different in their expressions. So they had very different yields. The characters of them were very different, except what they found out was that if you heat treated, I think it was Miche, it became like the Lampia clone. And the, what you were doing was killing off these viruses that were kind of endemic in it. And I said, actually, it turns out that the Miche clone it's the viruses that make it what it is. And this guy said, you know what? I've never in my career heard of somebody talking about viruses in a good way, as though they're in some way beneficial to the plant. And I said, what's your career? He says, I'm a virologist. No. He said, yeah. Turned out he'd won the Nobel Prize for Medicine for his work in viruses in 1974. Was, no, 76, that was it. Anyway, I then looked him up later on, and it turned out that this guy, somebody just said he'd saved more lives than anybody else, more lives from cancer than anyone else in the world because of his discovery. And he uh, did lots of work on hepatitis B. And I'm sure there are virologists today who will be working on COVID-19 who will owe some debt to Barry Blumberg. So Barry Blumberg, Barry Blumberg, 
a, a, a toast to you. Thank you very much for your work. He died a few years ago. He was putting Man on Mars, I seem to remember, was his last project. And um, the reason that I remember it as well, I remember exactly when it was, it was in 2018, as we were coming down into Kettle, a lo lovely pub called the Bluebell Inn, um, his son-in-law was Mark Thompson, who's the Director General of the BBC. He now today uh, is Chief Ex Executive of the New York Times. And Mark's phone was going ballistic. And so I'm chatting away to Barry quite happily, and Mark's disappearing. It turned out that the head of Radio 2 was phoning him because um, Russell Brand and Jonathan Ross had just rung up Andrew Sachs, left a message on his aunt's machine about his, you remember that, about his uh, granddaughter. And so Mark Thompson was trying to deal with a massive crisis, nearly brought down the BBC. And I'm on a rambling holiday talking about Alexander Pope. We have the same English teacher, so we were talking about English teacher, Barry Blumberg. So go and look up Barry Blumberg, amazing guy. And now you know a little bit about uh, viral variation in Nebbiolo. This is really delicious wine. This is sort of certainly good Premier Cru level Burgundy, but and possibly even Grand Cru level Burgundy, but much better value. Mm. Pira, that is absolutely beautiful. It's a really gorgeous little vineyard. Um, Vigna Rionda is a sort of rounded little hill and it's a beautiful little crew uh, in Cerro Longa d'Alba. Go and visit, go on the website, go through to our Wine Rest Partner page and you'll go get yourself a little holiday trip later on. Right, a few questions, otherwise I'll just bang on all night. Um, Daniel Mardle says, what made you choose the three wines to taste in the tasting and which is your favourite? Um, well, what we do, Daniel, is I just get in touch with friends who run independent wine merchants and they get in touch with me. So thank you. Keep coming in, all you indie local wine merchants. And what I do is I say to them, you choose. I want you to go and tell me what you're really enjoying in your shop right now. And they're brilliant. They all get in touch and they send along these wines. So I don't choose what they are. I say to the indies, you know, you tell me what you'd like us to go and talk about. And you know what? We haven't had a bad one yet. I love all of them for different reasons. So I hope, hopefully that answers. Um... Bridget, uh, Brigitte Kennell, I suspect that's how you pronounce it because you are from Ontario, Canada. Uh, you've recently found a show. It's amazing. Thank you so much. And you found Wine Show at home. Um, it's been the highlight of my isolation day. That genuinely makes all of us really tough. We're all sort of working away uh, doing it. Louis and me and Charlotte and uh, Al, we're the ones who sort of... Uh, bashing away, phoning each other all day. Uh, have I been to Ontario? I have. I travelled through on a train. That is a story for another day. It's involved me doing lots of accents from a, a Japanese linguistic student. And he was there saying, can you tell me the difference between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland? So I have to sort of go for never, never, never. I do actually know Ian Paisley Jr. I know he's just talking away, he loves Wayne. And then I would have to sort of go across to being Father Ted and doing Southern Irish accents. And people are nosing, don't do that, don't do that. Uh, do I have a favourite wine or region? I love the wines of Stratus. There you go. Stratus wines and um, are really nice. Uh, Rachel Cope, a Rochelle Cope, which Amarone do you recommend? Two, Bertani, who I think were the creators of Amarone in the, in the old days for old school Amarone, and uh, Muzella for new modern wave Amarone. Uh, Sarah G on Twitter, I love Albarino but can't find it on menus very often. Do I have recommendations for other non mainstream wines as an alternative? Yes. Uh, dry ferment? Love dry ferment, goes with everything. It's a half sibling of Riesling, so it's aromatic. Half sibling of Chardonnay, so it goes well with food. Uh, Godello, so which is really lovely. In fact, Godello's kind of a new Albarino. Alvarino, Portugal's variation. Um, Verdejo, which is tangier, it's more like a Sauvignon Blanc style, I guess. Um, Vermentino, if you're not in uh, Spain, go for Vermentino. Uh, George Stay at Home Williams. My Corona comprises PE with Joe the Body Coach. Very good plan. Uh, number two, Stay Home Save Lives, although you do go for a dog walk. Number three, Catch Up on Magazine Reading Backlog. This is going to tell us what magazines you are reading there. I'm saying nothing, George. And four, Wine Show at Home. Perfect sense of the day. Uh, we've had some bits about people, I don't know, we've got into a weird thing, but people told us who they've sold and to whom. Um, my friend John Graves, he says, I once served Taramasalata to Demise Roussos in a Queensway deli. John Graves, for those of you who may know, you may remember, if anybody's about my age and you're into independent bands, uh, he was the bassist in Family Cat, or The Family Cat. 
remember them. The sort of very, well, not, they were early Britpop. Very good band. Uh, Tim Hollis Carroll, I once sold wine to Edward Woodward, delightful fella, I'm sure he was, and Noel Edmonds. I'm not going to say what you think of Noel Edmonds. Essex Wine Man, this is a sensible question. Uh, what do I think of all the champagne houses planting vineyards in England? Flattered. That's what I am. I'm flattered. Uh, do we have any other questions? I think we've pretty much done them all. We're nearly there. That's us for today. Thank you all very much for joining us. We'll be back tomorrow. Remember, look after your postman. Go and visit a local if you're a hotel or a restaurant. Get yourselves over to Phil Glass and Swigert on the website. Have a look at the wines. There's some really, really gorgeous wines there. Thank you very much, guys. These are now going out to the NHS. So hardworking workers, stay at home, save lives, and plan your holiday later on. I look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.